Second part. That wasn't where Meg had come in. Dee had probably entered the building without encountering Lord Denai. When they went outside and saw the view, it was indeed different. Meg couldn't begin to guess where in that vast site Denai might be. Tired. The sudden question made her flinch. Even if heaven and earth switched places, the gorgeous young man didn't seem likely to say such a thing. Looking at this young man, you could tell that beauty and humanity were absolutely incompatible. Meg immediately felt the trembling building within her. Not at all, she replied. Though the girl wanted to show his concern was appreciated, the truth was she actually didn't feel the slightest bit fatigued. Next, he asked, what will you do? Does he mean what I think? Meg thought, the thrill racing through her. What'll I do? You mean if I said I'm going with you, you'd bring me along? She asked curtly, an undisguised expectation in her voice. Not that she ever thought he'd grant her wish. Sure, Dee said, his arm looping around Meg's waist. What are you doing? We need to hurry. As he'd said, he began to knife through the wind, his speed so great it made the average person sprint, look like a turtle's pace. Five minutes after they plunged into the forest, waves of blue light closed on the pair from behind. That was the end of the accursed facility. Dad. Mom. Haida. Meg said their names, intending to recite a requiem for them. Page break. The two of them decided to spend the rest of the night in a clearing that lay in the middle of the forest. Meg had her suspicion something was wrong, but they were swallowed up by the waves of joy rippling through her heart and the fog that lingered in the area. Since Meg had already recounted her journey thus far back by the laboratory, Dee didn't ask her anything further about that. Though he did inquire about the machinery the strange woman had appeared before, before the girl had met Dajin such as the size and shape of it. He asked it so casually, and Meg herself soon forgot all about it. Unexpectedly, the hunter said to her, Your business here should be finished now. You can go back to your village. I'll see you to the bay. You can go back on the boat I used to come over. What? You won't bring me all the way back to the village, she asked, knowing fully well she was being unreasonable. I'm in a hurry. You can wait at the bay if you like, but there's no guarantee I'll make it back. That was how every day must have been for him. Meg actually flinched at the thought of how hard and fierce those days would be. No. I'll go with you, she responded, but not because of her competitive nature. Why? I, well, I didn't come over here just for my family. I was here to save everybody. I've had some pretty scary experiences, and I could do without having any more. But as long as somebody might be left, I can't go home. Meg said that fully prepared to be mocked as an idiot. Such conventional resolve was no more than the babbling of a little girl in light of the shocking reality of this island. Who could have believed Dee would say to her, Okay, come with me, but you'll be risking your life. The warning he depended seemed like little more than futile whispers to Meg's ears. Earlier, 
She'd noticed that Dee had his saddlebags over his shoulder. He'd pulled an atomic torch out of them and switched it on, providing Meg with light and warmth. After watching him get it out, there was something she wanted to ask him. At first she thought she really shouldn't, and it held her tongue. But on seeing that he indeed used his right hand to undo the flap of the bag, she finally said, What happened to your left hand? It's resting, Dee replied. Huh? Food poisoning. Still, that was enough for Meg to follow. I see. From its voice, it sure sounded like a glutton. So resting as in peace. Not yet. Too bad. Meg said, and then she suddenly seemed to remember something, and stood up with a gasp. I felt so safe with you around, I forgot something. I've got to make some harpoons. I'm going to go see if I can find some promising branches. Stay in the light, Dee told her. Okay. Meg went over to a nearby stand of trees and looked for some nice straight branches. But she didn't fare well, as most were too short or crooked. Still, she managed to cut nearly a dozen, and thought to herself, they should do. When in the stand of trees off to her right, she spotted the perfect branch about eight or nine feet off the ground. Though she couldn't jump up and grab it, fortunately, there were other branches growing about three feet below it. If she were to grab hold of one, and then use it as a step, it looked like this might just work. After a quick glance over to confirm Dee was there in the torchlight, Meg grabbed hold of the lower branch. Kicking off the tree trunk and climbing, she got to where the desired branch was right in front of her. Taking the knife she'd held between her teeth, she pressed the blade into the base of the branch. But at that instant, there was a rustling of her head. Looking up, Meg bugged her eyes. Not eight inches away, a man's face was peering down at her through the fog. From Meg's perspective, it was upside down. More surprising still, it was a face she recognized. Bo? A heartbeat later, the young bounty hunter twisted his lips into a grin and was sucked into the darkness overhead. As if jerked back by some incredible force. What's Bo doing here? The girl said to herself. The encounter was so bizarre. It was strange Meg hadn't fallen right over out of the tree. However, she made it safely back down to the ground. It came as little surprise she showed no intention chasing after the bounty hunter. Be careful, Dee. I just saw. She shouted, but on turning she gasped in astonishment. There was no sign of Dee by the glow of the torch. She called out his name in spite of herself. The night grew deeper and deeper, with fog creeping across the ground and snowing at the trees. But Meg ran through night and fog, not out of fear. Rather, she was concerned about Dee. Oh. She was in a copse of trees about a hundred feet west of where Dee had vanished. In the center of a grassy area surrounded by enormous trees, Dee stood with both his sword and his right arm extending from his side. Dee! A split second before she called out to him, Meg caught sight of an object, knifing through the air at him from his right. What jabbed into the ground a good ten feet shy of Dee was none other than a short spear. 
That's Lancer's spear. Is he here too? If he was, it was a sloppy throw. Meg couldn't believe a seasoned professional would have his weapon fall so short of the mark. However, Meg's thoughts abruptly changed. Professionals don't miss, which could only mean it was thrown here on purpose. The ground suddenly shook. The grassland and enormous trees were being swallowed by a massive subsidence a hundred feet in diameter. D? Meg's eyes bulged in their sockets. She just spotted the black garb vision of beauty floating in the air over the subsidence. No, he wasn't actually floating. From where he'd stood, he was headed in a beeline to his ride, in a leap for the far edge of the sinkhole. While the powerful arc of the hunter's leap was impressive, and the sight of him sailing through the air was exquisite. And Meg got the feeling that beauty alone was enough to execute such a great bound. However, just then Dee's movements went into disarray. The leap had been just a bit short, and he hung from the brink of the hole by one hand. Though he'd narrowly managed to grip his sword between his teeth, he was in no position to use it. This was truly a do-or-die situation, and the girl was left wondering if a child with a toy bow and arrow couldn't shoot Dee through the heart and finish him off. The wind whistled. Something skimmed by the girl's cheek. Unconsciously, she reached out with her right hand. The hard, sharp feel of it in her grip told Meg it was an arrow which took her breath away. On account of that, the girl wasn't able to stop the other two arrows whistling through the air in flight. They pierced Dee's upper body as he hung there like a bagworm. Dee! Meg shouted, and she was just about to run toward him when something hard and blisteringly hot sank into both her thighs. Tumbling forward onto the ground, the girl twisted herself around and saw the person who stood behind her. He fixed the fresh arrow into his undersized bow and pointed it at Meg. It was Bo. Don't go making trouble, Meg. How ugly and mean his endearing smile had become. Perhaps the fall lay in the pair of fangs speaking from his curved lips. Bo, not you two. Well, I did get turned into one of the nobility, and I don't think I was the only one, he said. But now that I am one, it's pretty damn good. I don't have to chase my prey through deserts in summer like I used to, blood nearly boiling and always dehydrated. I don't have to freeze myself to the bone at the water's edge, the icy seas up north. Shooting a hundred arrows just to a bag, a lousy target, who's hiding behind a North Sea beast. Those old wounds in my right arm and left leg don't bother me no more. And new ones heal up lickety split, no matter how bad they are. You know, Meg, I really want to be a hunter now. You traitor. Meg groaned, though she knew Bo couldn't help it. His betrayal still came like a knife to the belly, making anger roil up within her. Traitor. That's a new one on me. The old me and the new me are like two whole different people. As different as a man is from a woman, Meg. To be a traitor, you have to know what it is you're doing, right? Well, I didn't get no time to hash it out before I was made one of the nobility, a vampire. And when I saw what I'd become, I was pleased as punch. How about it, Meg? You gonna join us? I see the way you're eyeballing me now. 
But once you're one, we'll be bosom buddies. We'll say we swear our loyalty to one another and drink a toast in blood when we have ourselves a ceremony. What kind of ceremony? Meg asked, and her body shook. More than anger, it was out of repulsion. A wedding ceremony, of course. Now you've got me all bashful, making me come right out and say it. But that conversation will keep till later. Hey, Lancer, I'm about to put three arrows through the heart of our little bagworm. Once I do, bury him good with that avalanche spear of yours. A proper burial and everything. Are we conscientious hunters or what? Bo cocked an ear in Meg's direction. His vampire hearing had caught something she'd mumbled. What was that? I said you talk too much. Meg shouted, spitting the words out like they were filth. A real man keeps his mouth shut and drinks Naparo beer. A long time ago, a troop of puppeteers traveling the frontier had come to the village by the sea. Their activities were sponsored by a beer company located in the higher latitudes. And aside from the line of commercial endorsement before, during and after the show, the puppets had done the entire performance in pantomime. Meg screamed, and that wasn't all. Seemingly having forgotten the pain of being shot through both thighs, she rose, braced her lower half properly, and hurled one of the branches she held. Second part end.